Gulf Coast cities washed away by increasingly intense hurricanes, Alaskan villages slipping into the ocean without sea ice to protect them from winter storms, and low-lying islands and coastal areas slowly losing ground to rising sea level. These physical vulnerabilities are serious, but as we will hear from our witnesses today, communities around the world face a variety of challenges from global warming and our dependence on fossil fuels. The price of oil is once again breaking records. With the American economy um, already shaky from the mortgage crisis, some analysts believe a prolonged oil spike could tip the economy over into a recession sending America reeling from oil speculators, OPEC, and oil addiction. Rising oil and gasoline prices affect all American families, but it is especially acute for the working poor. For a family owning one car making $20,000 a year, $3 per gallon gasoline consumes almost 9 percent of its annual income alone, adding in the other energy costs raises their fossil fuel bill even further. And while we are paying more for fossil fuels, the global warming caused by their combustion can undermine parts of the economy in the United States and around the world. A University of Maryland report released earlier this week found that economic impacts of climate change will occur throughout the United States and that the negative impacts will outweigh the benefits for most sectors that provide essential goods and services to society. Today we will learn how the health of the economy of the Maldives is dependent on the health of their coral reefs. Our reliance on fossil fuel may be hard on the wallet, but the costs do not stop there. Over 70 percent of African Americans and 50 percent of Latinos live in, in counties that violate federal air pollution standards. And unsurprisingly, they have higher prevalence of asthma and other debilitating lung diseases. This adds up to substantial costs in terms of health care and lost days at school and work. Just as our reliance on fossil fuels poses physical, economic, and health threats, the alternatives will reduce pollution harmful to the health of people and the planet and will create new jobs and energy savings for consumers. This is precisely why the New Direction Democratic Congress has put an energy bill which, is no, longer, which no longer looks to fossil fuels as the favored fuels, but rather leads us to, in a new direction towards uh, renewable electricity, energy efficiency, and biofuels. In combination with its counterpart in the Senate, by 2030, this new energy bill has the potential to save more than twice the amount of oil we currently import from the Persian Gulf, to reduce U.S. global warming pollution by up to 40 percent of what we need to do to save the planet, and create over 1.5 million jobs. By including Representative Solis's green jobs legislation, the energy bill will also provide the tools and the resources to train the workers needed to bring the green revolution to all communities. This fall, Congress has an opportunity to pass an energy bill that will make a significant contribution to our global warming goals, reduce the energy and health bills of American families, and create jobs in communities that need them the most. We are already seeing the effects of our intertwined uh, energy and global warming challenges in vulnerable communities across our nation and world. However, this crisis will not exclusively target our most vulnerable. They may be the first to feel the impacts, but in no way will they be the last. Without strong and consistent energy and global warming policies that look to improve our nation and world's energy and environmental future as a whole, we will find all of our communities vulnerable. Today, we have an opportunity to hear the representatives of communities already feeling the impact of global warming and our reliance on fossil fuels uh, and the impact that that has upon them as well, and a chance to learn from them what policies would most help their communities meet these challenges. I look forward to the testimony from our witnesses, and I now turn to recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Today's hearing will focus on the plight of those who are in the path of nature. 
from the coastlines of the Gulf of Mexico to erosion in Alaska to rising seas around the Maldives, these problems are real and threaten real people. And like many on this panel, I have concern for those people whose homes and livelihoods are being affected by this change in nature. But I am also concerned that today's hearing will do little to offer constructive and realistic solutions to these problems. Rising waters may well be an effect of global warming, but just how can we get these waters to recede? The answer that many will offer today is regulation, regulation, and more regulation. It is as if some people believe that government regulation and taxes will have the same gravitational pull on the oceans that the moon does. They don't. As we look for ways to address the global warming problem, we are looking for ways to produce energy and to power transportation without emitting CO2. It is my hope that researchers can soon develop the kinds of breakthrough technologies that will allow people all over the world to enjoy clean, clean, cheap energy. New energy and transportation technologies have the potential to lower energy costs, improve the environment, and end the world's reliance on unstable countries for energy fuels. That's the type of win-win solution that Republicans like me are seeking. It seems that many people believe that by enacting regulations, the work on glo global warming will be complete and that the waters will miraculously ebb. They won't. As we already have seen, regulations have done little to lower the CO2 emissions in Europe, with one recent report showing that so far all of Europe's extreme regulatory efforts have actually led to a 1 percent rise in emissions. Additionally, anecdotal evidence shows that aside from some outfits that sell carbon credits, the regulations aren't doing much to help Europe's economy either. It goes without saying that the European regulations are doing nothing to help keep water levels down. I do not wish to make light of the dangers faced by communities which are in the path of nature. But I do not think that regulatory measures that make energy much more expensive are the answer that will save places like the Maldives. My concern is, is that by enacting tough cap and trade regulations without having the needed developments in energy technology, we will see dramatic rises in energy prices that will threaten the jobs and economy of not just the poor but everyone. My fear is that in 100 years, people in this country will still continue to battle high energy prices, while people in the Maldives will continue to battle high water levels. That's what I call a lose-lose scenario, and Congress should seek to avoid it. Now you'll back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I do appreciate what my friend from Wisconsin talked about. Uh, I do think we are interested in breakthrough technologies to the extent that they are available. But the irony is that the, we don't have to wait for breakthrough technologies. We know what to do in terms of reducing energy consumption. We know what to do in terms of having global cooperation. Our friends in Europe uh, already have half the CO2 emissions that we have. Um, and the people in the Maldives, it's uh, one-tenth of our uh, emission levels, uh, yet they are very likely to be paying the price first. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to hear firsthand from folks who have this perception, uh, have the perceptive uh, notion of, of helping us understand the pressures that are being faced. And it's not just uh, the poor in remote areas. We've already seen what's happened to the poor in uh, New Orleans uh, with Katrina. Um, I have here something that was just given me today about uh, from New York. What if New York City were hit by a Category 3 hurricane? What if the most densely residential city in the country loses hundreds of thousands of homes in a few hours? The reconstruction, where people will leave, uh, live. Uh, these are very real problems for people at home and abroad, and I am looking forward to the uh, discussion here today to have a better sense of urgency, which is lacking, I am afraid, with this administration and too many people in this Congress. Thank you, and I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis, is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to also welcome our witnesses uh, this morning. I think it's highly important that we hear from underrepresented communities and communities of color because for many, many years, the environmental movement hasn't always brought about the concerns of our communities. And, and therefore, I think that this is a first good step working towards that initiative to try to include, to be as inclusive as we can, because global warming and the effects that it will have impact disproportionately low-income communities, even in more harsher terms than we even know. And I can uh, testify to that as uh, having grown up in uh, parts of Los Angeles County where I, in a district that I represent, we have three Superfund sites. We have water that is contaminated through rocket fuel. We have high levels of smog that we're experiencing and therefore are seeing higher incidence of asthma rates, higher rates of cancer, and also uh, the mortality rates of many of our young people as well as our adults, our seniors, are faced with. If we don't begin to address this issue of climate change and how it affects urban centers but also rural communities, I think that we are really going to be leaving a lot of people out of this discussion. And I'm very proud to serve as a member of this committee to be able to talk and, and hopefully amplify the voices that you witnesses here today bring to the table. You know, in a community like mine, Lat Latinos don't often have have the luxury of working in even uh, communities where their environment is safe. And I mean safe in terms of health effects, because of pollutants in the air, because maybe the proximity where they live is close to a freeway. In fact, many of the school districts that I represent are no more than one half mile from a, a freeway where you know the exhaust from our cars and our diesel trucks are just continuing, continuing uh, to spew these CO2 emissions. And it is having an effect because you see it in the costs that we're paying in health care and in, in trauma centers. And you see it afflicting not just people of color, but people who are trying to make a living, middle, middle income individuals who are also having to, to face up to what is happening to them. In the state of California, we've been plagued with droughts very hot summers. We have many of our local communities that are now self-imposing uh, mandatory conservation efforts. And that's just one part of it. But when you tell a family, a working family, that they now have to pay $3.50 to get to, to work, and then know that they have no health insurance, and when they come home at night in that community, that they're still faced with many more hardships and trying, just trying to put food on the table, something has to be done. So I would just say I am, I am grateful that you are all here and look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair rep uh, recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I really appreciate this hearing for some very personal reasons. Um, I spent my teenage years growing up in Wichita Falls, Texas. I live, lived at 818 Gerald. I want to be very specific. And um, I didn't know that there was such a thing as living a great distance from uh, what we called at the time the cesspool, uh, which was the waste treatment plant, probably less than 300 yards from my back door. And then about 600 yards away was the city landfill. Uh, Any time we had a strong wind blowing across North Texas, uh, which happened quite a bit, uh, the whole tone of our community changed. People would stay inside because of the, the odor. And we took for granted, and you know, I, I don't think anybody can go back and figure out how many people have died as a result of uh, pollutants in the air. Uh, but they would be considerable. And then just three months ago, almost four months ago, Jimmy Rainey ran from the living room of his home with only his underwear, trying to get his inhaler to work. He died on the front lawn of his home. And I spoke at his funeral. I began to look at all of the numbers of African Americans and Latinos 
dying in urban areas of asthma. And then I can't help but think about the, the funerals in my hometown uh, the time I grew up. And then I began to look at this issue and find out that according to the National Law Journal, communities of color take about 20% longer to qualify for either the Superfund or to have any kind of remediation in their communities of what is clearly environmental injustice. Uh, the movement began in the 1980s. I'm not sure that there was much participation even then by the minority communities. And so this gives me an opportunity to not only talk about the issue, but hopefully uh, figure out ways. No one benefits by having a hearing without uh, learning something and then trying to fashion solutions. This is not an intellectual issue for me. It is real. I know human beings who have died. I have friends who have died. And asthma is running rampant in every urban community in this nation. And everybody who has an ounce of concern ought to be angry. I appreciate you calling this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Missouri very much. And, uh, and we'll now turn to our very distinguished panel. And our first witness, Martin Luther King III. He is the chairman and CEO of Realizing the Dream Incorporated. Uh, through the work of his new organization, he is working to restore and revitalize our communities and democracies around the world. Mr. King currently is holding a Looking, Listening, and Learning tour where he is studying the causes of poverty in 50 selected communities. This summer, he also helped organize the sons and daughters of many of the 20th century's world-renowned leaders in an unprecedented peace summit to launch the Gen 2 peace, Global Peace Initiative. The mission, of the, of, uh, the mission of the new initiative is to use their collective strength to take action through nonviolent, tangible steps to address instances of conflict and injustice worldwide. Mr. King, we look forward to your testimony whenever you are ready. Please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Markey and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. As the first son of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and Coretta Scott King, both of whom were human rights activists, uh, I've been involved in significant humanitarian and policy initiatives, whether as, president, as a presidential appointee to promote peace in foreign countries or as president of two of the nation's most recognizable civil rights, civil and human rights organizations. I am, as was stated, CEO and founder of Realizing the Dream currently, a nonpartisan organization that seeks to continue and advance the legacy and work of my parents. Realizing the Dream seeks to give a stronger voice to the economically disadvantaged and to foster the elimination of poverty in America. Uh, recently, I have been conducting a looking, listening, and learning tour to study the causes of poverty in 50 selected communities throughout the United States of America. I've completed tours of 35 communities, including three Native American reservations, communities across Appalachia and the Gulf Coast, as well as both urban and rural America. Forty years have passed since uh, my father's death, but his concerns about inequality and deprivation are at least as topical today as they've been in the past. 38 million Americans live below the official poverty line, the highest rate among developed countries. This number has increased by 4 million people over the last four years, the entire size of the state of Kentucky. Today, his words still provide hope and inspiration to all of us, a resounding echo of the moral leadership that has, at critical junctures of our nation's history, lifted America to a higher place. In 1964, upon winning the Nobel Prize, my father said, granted that we face a world crisis which leaves us standing so often amid the surging murmur of life's restless sea. But every crisis has both its dangers and opportunities. It can spell either salvation or doom. Today, a new world crisis looms, one that we knew little about 40 years ago. Last week, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to former Vice President Al Gore and to a panel of 2,000 scientists who've been lifting our veil of ignorance on global warming, on the global warming crisis. There's a bridge between this crisis and that which my father confronted. 
because, uh, because both require a new paradigm of moral courage and leadership. In this climate crisis, I, see, uh, I too see both opportunity and danger, and I'm hopeful that we can find our salvation. I'm here today to tell you that global warming is a form of violence upon the most vulnerable among us and to ask for you to step forward and to protect those in need. Obviously, I'm not a scientist or an expert on global warming, but I listen to those experts and I listen to the people and communities across this nation who are concerned about the health and safety of those families, of their families. To lift families from poverty, we need to empower people to take charge of their lives and the life of their communities. Global warming and other environmental threats erode that power. The poor are victims of choices made by corporations over which they have no say. And Congress needs to protect all Americans from the threats that are being created. Earlier this year, the scientific panel that last week won a share of the Nobel Prize released reports compiling the consensus views of thousands of scientists and agreed to by the nations of the world, including the United States. I want to point to a statement by the chairman of that panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who said, it is the poorest of the poor in the world, and this includes poor people even in prosperous societies who are going to be the worst hit. According to the IPCC report, hundreds of millions of people are vulnerable to flooding due to sea level rise. The human suffering from Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina serves as vivid testimony to all of us of the vulnerability of the poor to, serve, to, to severe weather events and floods. The scientific report in many ways echoes the findings of, land, of a landmark report by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, from 2004 titled African Americans and Climate Change, an Unequal Burden. The caucus report concluded that African Americans will disproportionately bear the substantial public health burden caused by climate change. According to the report, African Americans are nearly three times as likely to be hospitalized or killed by asthma as others, with climate change expected to worsen air pollution and increase the incidence of asthma for our children. When disaster strikes, the, the poor are left in harm's way. As one illustration, according to the Congressional Black Caucus report, African Americans are 50% more likely than others to be uninsured. I want to be clear, however, that global warming is a dire threat for all of the nations and the world's poor. As was the case 40 years ago, what appeared to many Americans to be mostly an African American issue still today concerns the whole nation. Poverty in America today affects all races. The majority of the poor are white, not African American or Hispanic. We are all in this struggle together, poor or rich, black or white. While global warming is a crisis, it is not a cause for despair. I am filled with hope. Every generation has had to tackle threats of magnitudes that are almost unimaginable to us today. Global warming has been ignored for far too long, and it is time for our generation to step forward. Solving global warming can help lift the poorest among us and provide new economic opportunities. Global warming is fueled by our dependence on dirty energy fuels that are sell our health and drain our wallets. The pathway to solving global warming is a pathway to safer communities for our children and better economic opportunities. I would like to lend my support to the testimony of Van Jones, president of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, who came before this committee in May. He outlined a national commitment to green collar jobs that will give ordinary Americans a shot at long, lifelong careers in the growing clean energy economy. As Congress crafts an action plan on global warming, we must also look to the economic impacts of the plan on the poor. The financial resources to provide economic opportunity and avoid economic burdens that are at hand if it embraces the principles that industrial polluters should bear primarily the, res the financial responsibility for their actions. When designing an emissions trading system for greenhouse gases, Congress should inv invest revenues from polluters' payments to help the poor be a part of the solution and to protect those who are least able to afford the cost of cleaning up. 
We all need the moral courage to rise above the complacency, to rise above the injustice, and to rise above the political differences that have led us to turn deaf ears to this crisis again and again and again. I conclude by asking, who among us will aspire to the opportunity and salvation that lies within cli the climate crisis? Where are the voices of hope today in America? Who among us will stand up and lift our children and the poorest among us from the impacts of a crisis not of their making? Who here in Congress will lead this fight and put aside the whispering of those who fear change? The energy bill that the House has passed is a strong first step. Congress needs to pass a bill with the best parts of both the House and Senate version, and it must, stop there. It must not stop there, but keep pressing forward even more comprehensive solutions. Chairman Markey, I appreciate your leadership on these matters and the work of other committee members. There are many leaders among you. I ask you all to work together to lead and look forward to supporting your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. King, very much. Um, our second witness is Dr. Eileen uh, Gauna, who is a law professor at the University of New Mexico with a focus on environmental law, environmental justice, administrative law, and energy and property. She is one of the country's foremost experts on environmental justice and has written about and worked extensively on the issue. She is also a member of the EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Dr. Gauna, we welcome you. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Um, one correction, I am uh, no, not, no longer a present member of NEJAC. I completed my term, one of my several terms. Um, but thank you for your invitation to testify uh, before the committee today. Um, your work on energy independence and climate change is complex and it's urgent. And I'm really encouraged that you're not falling prey to this urgency by ignoring the effects of new energy policies on our most vulnerable communities. That single focus in the past has led to poor communities and communities of color bearing not only the, the brunt of increased exposures, but an increased risk of accidents, insufficient energy and emergency infrastructure, degradation of natural resources, and other environmental disamenities, noise, dust, odors, uh, light pollution. My work has taken me to many stressed communities throughout the United States where you can really vividly see, hear, smell, taste uh, the result of our lack of comprehensive policies on industrialization, waste disposal, and energy supply. It's a long neglected problem, and it's encouraging to see it being addressed at this level. Your committee also seeks to do more. As shifting energy policies create new opportunities, you're attempting to ensure that poor and vulnerable communities share in those opportunities. But because of the complexity of the problem, there are pitfalls, and there's a risk for unintended consequences along the way, and it's a few of those discrete unintended consequences I would use, like to use my time to address today. In the process of retooling our energy infrastructure, we are going to undoubtedly encounter significant siting issues. We need renewable sources such as wind farms, waste energy plants, biofuel production facilities, more high voltage transmission lines. We need more production facilities for solar panels or other uh, equipment to build a newer, greener energy supply. Then there are other forms of energy supply presently under consideration, such as nuclear power plants, cold fire power plants with uh, carbon capture and sequestration capacity, more imported liquefied natural gas, all cleaner from a global warming perspective, but the processes themselves may carry significant risks. If there is no thought on the front end to where these facilities and how they will be sited, there is going to be chaos at the back end. This is not good for utility companies, communities, our domestic ecosystems that are more vulnerable to climate change effects, and it is not good for energy security and independence. Let me give you one quick example. Uh, we recently launched a concerted campaign to increase importation of liquefied uh, natural gas. 
by adding about 40 or 50 facilities to our existing five. If you take a look at the FERC website, you'll see a map of the existing and proposed LNG facilities. Now take a look at the website of this select committee and see the locations that are predicted to sustain the greatest impact from global climate change. The facilities are literally right in the eye of the coming storms. You can see that the Gulf Coast, heavily populated by poor and people of color communities, will receive the lion's share of these facilities, especially as communities and state opposition elsewhere remains fierce. What you see is an emerging pattern of racial disparity. And as we have learned from the present disparities in spatial location of hazardous waste facilities and high emitters, commonly called TRI facilities, these disparities, once formed, become intractable. Can a new, more comprehensive energy policy avoid this? It can. And it will be fair and more efficient over the long term. As we think about the new physical machinery of our clean energy infrastructure, we need to provide adequate protection. Federal legislation can and should protect vulnerable communities by avoiding increasing impacts on communities that are already heavily burdened. The experience in brownfield redevelopment has taught us that this is not the death knell for high impact projects. Quite the contrary. When potentially impacted communities are brought into the process at a very early time, many impacts can be minimized or avoided altogether, and communities are more likely to support the process if they are included in it and if they are given resources to independently review that project. As some developer, development attorneys can attest, and often do, the projects that have been least successful are those where project sponsors have tried to avoid legal requirements and shortcut the permitting process. Uh, in the long term, it delays projects. My, my written testimony has specific information as to how this can be done. I want to stress it is not to suggest a complete facility moratorium in vulnerable communities, but rather to suggest that vulnerable communities should not receive the highest impact facilities and the lowest paying jobs. With relatively small investment in job training and a common sense siting and permitting criteria, we can create equitable an equitable and efficient clean energy infrastructure. In protecting vulnerable communities, another matter is that we should avoid the temptation to grandfather existing facilities in new legislation. The pro proliferation of new coal-fired power plants, about 150 of them, in anticipation of more stringent climate change legislation should not be rewarded down the line. Um, we may yet be witnessing yet another disparity. Experience teaches us that regulatory agencies often narrowly construe their legal authorities when asked to provide protections for vulnerable communities. These communities are left suffering impacts that could have clearly been avoided. A simple requirement that impacts to vulnerable communities should be avoided, minimized, or mitigated to the extent feasible, together with a requirement for an alternative site analysis, can go a long way to inject common sense and protectiveness into the process. As pedestrian as siting and permitting issues may appear to some, especially in the face of the urgency of climate change, this much we should remember. This is the single biggest issue for these vulnerable communities. They are assaulted by staggering pollution loads. Our regulatory regime is not equipped to handle cumulative risks or synergistic effects. It's not designed or adequately funded and equipped to address multiple stressor situations. Let's not add to this problem. It is our ethical duty. Profe and Professor, if you could try I'm, to sum I'm up. I'm finishing up. It is our ethical duty to do all we possibly can to roll back and avoid climate change. It is our ethical duty not to do so on the backs of heavily impacted and vulnerable communities. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry for running no, over. No, no. Thank you, Professor, very much. Uh, our next witness is uh, Mr. Mike Williams. Mr. Williams is a member of the uh, Yupikak tribe uh, from uh, Akiak, Alaska, and an Iditarod race musher. Uh, throughout his life, he has strived to protect the livelihood and culture of native villages across Alaska. Uh, currently, 
He is vice chairman of both the Akiak Native Community and the Alaska Intertribal Council, which represents 229 tribes in Alaska. He is also vice president of the National Congress of American Indians, uh, Alaska region, and board member for National Tribal uh, Environmental Council. Uh, we welcome you, uh, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it is an honor to testify before you today. My name is Mike Williams. I am a Yupak, real people from Akiak, Alaska, located on the Kuskokwim River. Currently, I am vice chairman of the Akiak Native Community, a federally recognized tribe, and I also serve as a vice chairman for the Alaska Intertribal Council, which consists of 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska. In addition, I am vice president for the National Congress of American Indians, Alaska Region, and board member for National Tribal Environmental Council. Global warming is undermining the social identity and cultural survival of Alaska Natives American, and American Indians. We, as we match our watch our ice melt, our forests burn, our villages sink, our sea level rise, our temperatures increase, our oceans acidify, our lakes dry, and our animals become diseased and dislocated. We recognize that our health and our traditional ways of life are at risk. Our elders, in particular, are deeply concerned about what they are witnessing. In Alaska, unpredictable weather and ice conditions make travel and time-honored subsistence practices as hazardous, endangering our lives. According to the U.S. Corps of Eng Engineers, at least three tribes in Alaska must be moved in the next 10 to 15 years, Sismaref, Kevlina, and Newtok, while according to a GAO report, over 180 communities are at risk. Throughout the nation in Indian country, traditional foods are declining. Landscapes are changing. Rural infrastructure is being challenged. Soils are drying. The lake and river levels are declining. Tribes are experiencing droughts, loss of forests, fishery problems, and increased health risks from heat strokes and from diseases that thrive in warmer temperatures. Clearly, global warming represents one of the greatest threats to our future and must be addressed by Congress as soon as possible. There are many economic opportunities for Alaska Natives and American Indians in a low-carbon future, especially with the respect to renewable energy. Tribes offer some of the greatest resources for helping the nation with renewable energy development, particularly wind, solar power, biomass, and geothermal power. In Alaska, for example, we are installing wind power in very remote communities such as Tuxuk Bay, St. Paul Island, and Kotzebue. Wind power has also been installed on the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation. Port Graham Village is assessing construction of a biomass facility using forestry waste. The Confederated Tribes of the Warren Springs Reservation has analyzed the viability of a commercial geothermal power plant. Also, Native Sun Solar has installed hundreds of systems on the Navajo and Hopi reservations. To achieve Indian countries and Alaska's renewable energy potential, however, we need investment capital, infrastructure, and technical capacity. Any renewable energy program must include opportunities and incentives for tribes. Also, with training, American Indian and Alaska Native youth and adults can actively engage in renewable energy jobs from engineering to manufacturing to installation. There are also economic opportunities associated with energy conservation. We would welcome tribal-based initiatives to better insulate our homes, to convert our lighting, and to educate our members regarding energy efficiency practices. We want jobs and that save us money and reduce our carbon footprint. In general, we believe that the low-carbon economy 
will provide multiple local benefits by decreasing air pollution, creating jobs, reducing energy use, and saving money. With respect to adaptation, communities like New Talk in Alaska are already taking action to move from dangerous sites to higher ground. It is important for Congress to recognize that the adaptation needs are very great. We require planning assistance, federal coordination, and significant financial resources to educate these crucial relocations and to fund other adaptation needs. In recognition of this tremendously serious situation that global warming poses to American Indians and Alaska Natives, our most important organizations have passed urgent resolutions outlining problems, threats, and needed action by Congress, including the Alaska Intertribal Council, the Alaska Federation of Natives, over 100 Alaska uh, Native entities, and National Congress of American Indians. I have submitted all of these resolutions to the committee with my written testimony. In summary, Mr. Chairman, Alaska Natives and, and American Indians are be being seriously threatened by global warming. We implore Congress to protect current and future generations by documenting the extensive costs of global warming to tribes, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and helping those committees like Sishmaref to, uh, the, that need to be moved, repaired or otherwise assisted because of the adverse impacts of global warming. There is so much at stake. For the sake of our children and grandchildren, seven generations and beyond, Congress must meaningfully action to address this issue now. This is our most and sincere and urgent plea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Williams, very much. And our final witness is Mr. Amjad Abdullah, who is Assistant Director General of the Ministry of Environment, Energy, and Water for the Republic of the Mal Maldives. As Assistant Director General, he has brought to light many of the effects of global warming on his country and is actively working with the United Nations to find solutions for the Maldives and the world to the challenges presented by global warming. As we know on the committee, uh, the, um, the effects uh, two years ago of the, um, of the tsunami on the Maldives was to basically have a profoundly negative impact on 80 percent of its economy as those, that water just washed over the entire country. So we uh, thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished representatives. May I begin this morning by thanking you for the invitation to offer testimony to this important gathering. I'm honored to share the floor today with the noted human rights activist, Mr. Martin Luther King III. In 1963, his father, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial and delivered one of the most powerful speeches of the 20th century. Addressing the need for social political justice, he said, and I quote, we have come to this hollow spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. Today, Mr. Chairman, I come before to you to speak about the immediate and far-reaching impacts of global climate change. I come to explain that for the Maldives, this global phenomenon represents a crisis that threatens our very existence for us and for other vulnerable communities around the world. Failure to address this threat will have devastating consequences for human rights, homes, livelihoods, and ultimately human lives. I have come to this hallowed spot to ask you for your political, economic, and moral leadership to address climate change. I have come to tell you that if you overlook the urgency of this moment, it will result in the death of a nation, the Maldives, and the loss of vulnerable communities around the world. Mr. Chairman, distinguished representatives, climate change is the defining issue of our time and the fundamental challenge to the 21st century. Moreover, it is not an environmental challenge nor a scientific thesis. It is the first and foremost human issue. It is already adversely impacting individuals around the planet due to alterations of ecosystems, the increased incidence of natural disasters, these impacts have been observed to be intensifying in frequency and magnitude. 
The reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have established a clear scientific consensus and left us in no doubt the magnitude of the threat we face. Global warming is real, accelerating, and human-induced. The review by the, Envi by the eminent former World Bank economist Sir Nicholas Stern has demonstrated that unchecked climate change would trigger a global recession of enormous proportions. Turn 200 million people into refugees and precipitate the largest migration in modern history and their homes succumbed to droughts or floods. As a small island developing state, we in the Maldives are immediately and particularly vulnerable to even small changes to the global climate. In recent months, we in the Maldives experienced tidal surges on an unprecedented scale. Never in our doc documented history has so many islands been flooded or simultaneously and to such an extent. These surges were a grim reminder of the devastation, devastating tsunami of 2004 and a dangerous warning of future impacts. Even today, rising ocean temperatures coupled with the acidification caused by greenhouse gas threaten our prized coral reefs. These reefs are the mainstay of tourism and fisheries industries and the heart of our economic development. Let me briefly mention the geographic composition of the Maldives to the distinguished members of the Select Committee for a better understanding of its vulnerability from global warming and climate change. The Maldives comprises of approximately 1,190 small islands scattered in the Indian Ocean, with only 1% of land and 99% of sea. I use approximately because the number of islands varies with the tides. Our islands barely exceeds 1.5 meter above mean sea level. As we look for the horizon, we fear that the rising sea levels threaten the immediate and our land and submerge the entire nation. We are rising to meet the challenges as best we can. Our work focuses on adaptation, international negotiations, public diplomacy, and the human dimensions of global climate change. On adaptation, we have developed a concrete plan of action that aims to reduce the exposure of the impacts of global climate change. Our national adaptation plan of action, which have submitted in writing to the committee, outlines our most immediate initiatives on sea defenses, securing vital infrastructures, utilities, and so forth. Relocating people from smaller vulnerable communities to bigger islands is one of them. With regard to mitigation, our own carbon footprint is minimal. However, we are a vocal advocate for a comprehensive framework to replace the Kyoto Treaty. Internationally, we are leading an initiative in cooperation with other small island states entitled The Human Dimension of Global Climate Change. This initiative is designed to put people back at the heart of issue and highlight the threat, the threat climate change poses to human rights and human lives. We will convene a conference in the Maldives on the 13th of November this year, and I would be pleased to elaborate on this further during your questions. Mr. Chairman, although the impacts of climate change is going to be felt first in vulnerable countries such as the Maldives and other low-lying states, it does not end with us. The immediate and far-reaching threats reach into every nation, every community, and every neighborhood on the planet. If we are to avoid the devastating impacts of climate change, the major economic economies must take the lead. Action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions presents the greatest opportunity to preserve the, prospect, the prospects for future prosperity and the future delay risk irreparable harm to the sustainable development. We therefore urge the Congress to take the lead on reducing emissions and stabilizing, stabilizing greenhouse gas concentration at level that would restore the balance of the Earth's climate system. Technological innovation throughout our economic systems from energy and transport Mr. to construction Abdullah, will be... Could you, could you summarize your pivotal. comments? Pivotal. Our political please. systems need to encourage greater incentives for investment in cleaner technologies, public transportation, and so forth. Mr. Chairman, just to conclude, 
During the past two decades, we have looked for signs of progress, but too often we have seen a lack of leadership in the international level. We believe this trend is changing. In 2007, we see the signs of renewed dynamism and determination. Speaking in London in July this year, the president of the Maldives, Mr. Maumoon Abdul Gayyum, more than two decades of climate change advocacy, he said, that there has been a great deal of expectations, but ultimately too many missed opportunities. In concluding this speech, he said, I quote, let us say enough of expectations and promises. It is time to deliver, enough of hesitation. It is now time for blood leadership. We thank the committee for your initiative, for your invitation today, and we encourage you to strengthen your leadership and maintain your current momentum. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Our chairman has uh, stepped away. He had about two dozen guests here. He'll be back in a moment uh, and ask that we proceed. Uh, I would just note that we are going to be facing a vote pretty soon, so we'll try and I'd like to just move quickly. I would just ask one question and then turn to my colleagues. Mr. Williams, uh, you uh, painted a, a pretty significant picture of what is facing um, uh, uh, the Native American community, the uh, uh, Alaskan corporations. Um, I'm wondering if you are aware of any specific programs in place at this point that address the concerns of Native American populations as it relates to the consequences of climate change the, uh, and, and adaptation that you referenced. Yeah, right now uh, we are uh uh, at the crossroads, and uh, many of the uh, uh, communities like Sushmaraf is falling into the Bering Sea, and uh, and um, I think uh, uh, for a, a, some village uh, of New Talk is currently planning to move uh, into a, a higher ground, and um, that I think um, uh, is uh, one way of uh, retreating from. Uh, um, falling into the sea, and uh, that is the uh, only uh, thing that is occurring. And what we've been trying to do um, is involving ourselves in uh, <clears throat> in uh, trying to address um, the uh, effects in the north, in the Arctic, and uh, and we are um, uh, we have been involved in trying to uh, um, uh, have uh, EPA uh, to. Uh, enforce the regulations in the, um, uh, 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 on the automobiles and also the power companies in the East Coast because all of these, um, uh, uh, all of these activities affect uh, uh, the people in the North. So we are most vulnerable and paying a heavy price for that um, uh, activities in other areas uh, of the world. So um, right now uh, we need, again, uh, we need uh, uh, capital, we need uh, more resources to uh, plan for the future because my community is going to be on, in the river and in the, uh, in the sea um, pretty quick uh, if we don't address it soon. Thank you very much. Ms. Blackburn? Thank you, sir. I want to welcome all of our uh, witnesses for us today. Uh, Mr. King, I commend you for your listening tour. It sounds like it has been instructive. Uh, Mr. Williams, I think I'd like to direct my first question to you, if I may. Uh, the wind turbines that are being stall installed in Alaska, where's the money coming from for those? Do you know? um, I think the money is uh, coming from um, um, the um, uh, from Congress and uh, and those. Uh, uh, you know, the energy costs are tremendous in Alaska. In my community, um, the ga uh, price of gasoline is $7 an so hour. So basically but, you're uh, depending. But that, that, uh, the wind uh, um, uh, programs in Kotzebue, in Kasigaluk, in Tuksuk Bay have really reduced the uh, 50 cents an hour per kilowatt hour uh, problem that we're facing in a very poor communities, the poorest of the poor in the country. Let me ask you this also. Okay, so on the wind turbines, you're depending on government grants for, for that. But let me ask you about uh, transporting renewable 
energy to some of these rural and isolated areas. What solutions do you propose or do you all have any solutions that you're proposing for transporting renewable fuels into these rural areas? Uh, I would, um, I think uh, shipping uh, right now is uh, the way to go, um, you know, because we don't have any roads uh, in um, our areas and, uh, and there's no uh, uh, other way to get to those communities. So barges okay. and shipping uh, through water ways. All right. I want to go to page three of your testimony. Uh, you talk there about Native Sun Solar, which provides installation, maintenance, technical support for the photovoltaic systems. They've installed hundreds of systems on the Navajo and the Hopi reservations. What is the cost per kilowatt hour for solar energy in Alaska? And what do residences, an average resident, actually pay uh, for electricity per kilowatt hour right now? Do you have that information? Yes, uh, uh, I have. Uh, I don't have a current uh, 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 data on uh, the Navajo and Hopi uh, per kilowatt hour, but uh, our in my community, per kilowatt hour for uh, paying for el our electricity ranges from uh, 50 cents to uh, uh, 70 cents per kilowatt hour in our communities in Alaska. Okay, and then for the solar, can you get that number for me? So uh, we'll right now that. in Alaska, it, it is, um, uh, I think uh, the wind power is more uh, viable and the solar energy in the winter time uh, okay. when there's 24 hours let, of let no solar, you. we don't see the sun up yes, north sir. for 24 hours for six months. It's pretty hard to get that uh, to retrieve. Yeah. The solar on the wind energy. power, let me ask you this one follow on. Has the environmental compute, uh, community expressed any concern over the wind turbines and the harmful effects for birds? Have you had resistance there? Uh, we have um, uh, discussed uh, that issue, uh, but uh, we would, um, you know, we have uh, uh, taken, a, taken a look, and I come from the uh, most uh, 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 populated migratory bird um, area in the world, and, uh, and we um, have uh, had those uh, pr uh, wind turbines going and uh, seen no effect uh, on, our, uh, on our migratory birds. Okay, thank you. Mr. Abdullah, uh, the sea level in the Maldives, what has been the actual rise of the sea level over the past year? Um, uh, for the sea level, we have, um, start, we have had a record of 15 years, and it shows about a millimeter of rise per year in sea level. And to this magnitude, even a small millimeter of the sea level it speeds up the, the wind-generated waves, and it, it sort of um, leads to flooding more frequently. Mm -hmm. And over the past year, did it remain the same, or was there a difference? Well, it, it has remained the same, but... Um, so uh, you continued to see a rise last year? Yes. Okay. And then how do you deal, have you dealt with the rising in the sea level? Well, um... Due to the sea level rise, I think we have we, we have started um, we have initiated a program on um, um, relocating people from smaller vulnerable islands. As you know, there's no higher ground in, in the Maldives. It's all flat. It's about 1.5 meter above mean sea level. There's no no higher ground where you can move in, and the islands are pretty smaller. And uh, the government has initiated uh, relocating small vulnerable communities to bigger one with coastal protection. And that is the only option that we can survive as a, as a sovereign state. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to direct my questions to Mr. King. Um, you mentioned in your discussion a reinvestment fund um, that we could possibly develop through uh, making the polluters responsible and paying into this reinvestment fund. Could you give me an idea what two, two components might be a part of that uh, critical reinvestment fund and why is it needed? Well, I, I think the, the, the real question is, is obviously um, when it comes to uh, communities of, of, of color particularly, 
and those who perhaps will be uh, impacted most by, uh, by what is occurring because of global warming. Uh, I guess there has to be a balance of some kind, and it would seem that one of the ways uh, those who are, you know, who are, I guess, heavy polluters, if you will, um, now what that specifically means today, um, I don't know that I can cite specific examples today. I certainly will be able to get something back to you on, on that. But I, I, what I think can happen, or I hope can happen, or in the past had, had heard, uh, is that because uh, these, these, these large entities that are ultimately, obviously, the solution is to create the kind of regulations so that we can begin to reduce what we're doing. Um, and in short, if there's a, this kind of fund that exists, mm -hmm. um, I, I think we, I don't, I don't, I hope one does not see that as putting an undue burden on those, those business entities. But, you know, I, I, I know we've got to do something, and that's just one suggestion. But I, I mean, I can certainly get something specifically back to you on that particular issue. Right. It isn't a foreign concept is kind of what I guess I want, want to hear, because in many cases, even the way our current laws are supposed to work, Superfund sites, for example, funding that uh, we get from polluters is supposed to go back in to clean up those communities. But we find that under current conditions in this administration, we have been negligent in that cleanup. Um, and and and, uh, and and particularly um, again as it relates to communities of color, where there seems to be um, a disproportionate number of not just Superfund sites, but I think there's statistical data that shows that communities of color generally are there's more. There's more uh, I don't want to say more polluters are there, but it just seems like there's a disproportionate yeah. Uh, number. Yeah, there's a lot more sightings. And in fact, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Gama, if you could just touch very briefly on, uh, you, you talked about setting some policy uh, decisions that would actually look at substantive criteria. And, and if you could please go over that, because it, you hit a, a lot of what I would like to see occurring in some of our public policy. And if you could be a little bit more specific and just give me some idea of, of how we do that when we're setting our policy. Thank you, Congresswoman Solis. That you know, really is a, you know, a rather technical area, but it's not insurmountable. Mm -hmm. I think that we have models that can work for example, the uh, avoid, minimize, mitigate model that we see uh, in wetland permitting and other areas where we're protecting vulnerable or highly fragile resources could actually work in an area of high impacted communities. Um, and, and those models do contain substantive criteria where you say, you know, if you, you reach a particular point where it really is a public health issue, uh, you're, you're going to need substantive criteria. Uh, that said, I think that procedural uh, uh, protections go a long way. Very basically, the earlier you get the, the communities involved in the project, the important thing to remember is that the communities are the people most intimately aware of the surrounding circumstances, especially in a multiple impact uh, area. Often when you get these communities involved very early, they can propose solutions that, that obvious that the permitting officials and other public officials tend to miss because they don't live in those areas. <laughs> so procedural criteria can go a long way. But when we're dealing with highly impacted communities, we, we need substantive criteria. We need legal authority from Congress that tells us when we need to, when, it, when it's not advisable. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Kansas City. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Mr. King and to Professor Guana, uh, I, I, my concern is I just have one, one question. Hopefully, hopefully you can give, give me some guidance. Uh, because we are the only nation in the Western world still not admitting climate change, um, 
which is an embarrassment in itself, but I, I don't want to deal with that embarrassment. Uh, <laughs> I try to conceal it. But the, the, um, if you look at what happened in the Ninth Ward in New, in, uh, New Orleans and realize that if you go down there now, you still have to put on a mask because the Ninth Ward is where the poor people lived, which is also where the landfill was. So in addition to the, to the rising waters and the alligators, you had all of the uh, contamination from the landfills. And it, in some areas, the, the ground is black. The, 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 the issue is, though, had we not had the flood, I'm not sure that there would have been any complaints about what was going on in Ninth Ward, because in minority communities, we've not been able to uh, generate the, the, the interest in the, in the climate change issue at a level that I think we should, uh, although the NAACP devoted its entire uh, monthly magazine of, uh, in, in July of August, uh, special edition, The Fight for Environmental Justice. Uh, but, but in terms of grassroot, root, the grassroots people, do you have any suggestions about uh, on what this committee could do to try to raise the interest, the uh, awareness of what's going on? Because they're victims whether they know it or not. So uh, can you give, give me some guidance on that, please? Either one of you. Well, clearly, the, the legislation that you uh, will propose and ultimately pass is going to, to, to do a lot of that, or, or I think go a long way toward addressing that issue. I, I, I think, it's, to, to me, uh, beyond the NAACP, it's all of the organizations um, certainly SCLC, Rainbow Push, National Action Network, the Urban League. I think collectively uh, it's part of our responsibility to also uh, inform the community. I think people of, of color often are, are in a survival mode. And while people know that these issues exist, it really is a matter of, of, of educating. And we really are depending on you as our leaders to be the, the voice to, to create the proper kind of legislation. Obviously, we would, certainly will do our part in terms of, of uh, coming to continue to raise issues. But I, I think historically, our nation has just kind of, just like we, we look at poverty, to, now we finally realize in this nation that uh, global warming is, is a crisis, I believe, even though, as you stated, uh, maybe an administration has not ad admitted it. And, and I think the moral leadership, I, I would, I think in the future, um, in, in the years to come, there's going to have to be a new moral tone set as it relates to global warming and other issues, particularly poverty, which I and, and many have been working on, uh, be, because we're, we're sort of in denial. And I don't think we have the luxury of, of denying anymore. Uh, this is an issue front and center that we've got to address for our own personal survival. Um, so as I say, we as organizations, I'm sure, are going to do our part, but we need uh, legislation from you as congresspersons. Thank you, Congressman. I, in my experience, there hasn't been apathy. In fact, there's been a great deal of interest coming from community and community-based organizations. I do see a disconnect between that and the higher levels of government. And to the extent that, at this level, you can put into legislation or policies provisions for collaborations between community-based organizations and federal and sub-federal agencies, I, I think you have a real nice synergy there that, that has been um, unexplored and unharvested up until this point. I think I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced the interest is there, uh, but we just need a way to connect that. I, I could be more specific in a follow-up piece or something like that, if you'd like, to how to increase this level of collaboration that's necessary. I agree with you. It's absolutely necessary. Uh, the gentleman from California. Well, I'm sorry. The list I had was <coughs> McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this panel has a very important and stark message that I've been hearing. Uh, global warming is impacting people's lives right now, today. Uh, it's a moral issue. And the northern communities and the island communities are being impacted, but 
no community is going to be immune in the future. Uh, so uh, there is a question here, though. Um, the, you spoke about uh, wind turbines and other forms of renewable energy, Mr. Williams. Is that impacting you in a positive way in terms of creating jobs more than uh, the jobs that are created, say, by shipping in oil or diesel fuel or whatever forms of energy used before the renewable energy is being used? <clears throat> well, uh, currently uh, there are limited um, uh, biomass um, efforts and also wind turbines are just, uh, um, just recently showed up to our communities. Uh, but clearly it has uh, created uh, uh, savings of uh, uh, energy costs to uh, consumers. Uh, and are very the poorest of the poor in the country, and uh, and the highest prices of energy due to transportation, etc. How about but jobs? I, I'm, uh, but I'm I, I'm seeing more um, jobs created uh, in these uh, communities uh, that have wind turbines, and also uh, the biomass is a, a local effort. Miss uh, Professor Gunn, I'd like you to address the same question when you. Uh, spoke, you talked more about the, uh, the concern of, of nat uh, le liquid natural gas and other forms of traditional energy. Uh, do you see the, the, how do you see that stacking up against the positive impact of local forms of renewable energy such as wind and solar in, in various areas? Uh, are you talking about the positive impact economically or are you yes. talking about the positive impact on health and so forth? Well, economically. Okay, you know, e economically, one thing that I've seen in, in my travels is communities are saying, you know, we need economic development. We're not anti-development. We need jobs, but we would like clean jobs. And so when you, when you compare uh, cleaner, not, not totally risk-free or pollution-free, but cleaner forms of renewable energy production versus the really heavy extractive industries, you know, coal bed methane, dewatering processes, and so forth that really degrade the environment, you will see a clear choice there. And communities, I think, by and large, uh, you know, would opt for uh, the cleaner jobs that are provided by renewable energy sources. Do you have a comment, Mr. King? on the economic impact of renewable energy? Well, I uh, certainly wouldn't proclaim to be an expert, but I would, I, I would certainly concur that I think that people, uh, for me, it, it, it really is information and education. And clearly, when people understand uh, the impact, uh, they will embrace uh, when you talk about um, uh, new alternative, even if we're talking about fuel sources, the kind of things that are going to just make our environment a better place. I think people um, will embrace that. And of course, because it does not exist, it would seem like it today, it does not exist enough. It seems like it would have an, a major uh, economic impact. Anything that perhaps is new it would seem to me would not just create interest, but would create opportunity and options. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you all for your testimony. I'm sorry I was uh, late uh, getting here. But uh, uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, the proliferation of uh, polluting or uh, uh, industrial sites in uh, areas where people of color are um, a large part of the population. I think it's also, at times, it's just uh, towns or regions or areas of little economic and political strength. And, and in my district, I have, for instance, uh, a, a battery factory that just shut down and left behind a terrible uh, polluted lagoon and uh, uh, heavy metal contaminations and so on. And it's, it's not. Uh, uh, a minority um, uh, ethnic group that lives there. It's a Caucasian American uh, small town that just happens not to be um, well off enough or perhaps educated enough about the environment to go out or, ha or to have the time. I think, as uh, Mr. King said, is you know you're trying to keep up and you're uh, um, it's hard to uh, take care of your family and. Uh, keep your head above water economically and still have time or money to hire lawyers and 
go to hearings and write letters and do all those things that other people with more resources uh, are able to do. Um, turning to uh, Mr. Williams and, and Mr. Aldola, I am particularly interested in um, the specific things that can be done to mitigate or adapt uh, to your communities and especially uh, the Maldives. I mean, uh, we have a few parallels here in the United States that people who live there have not realized yet. Uh, the outer, outer banks of the Carolinas, for instance, the uh, 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 Hilton Head, Tay Patras, uh, South Padre Island, Nantucket uh, Island, which is mostly very low elevation. All these places are going to be underwater. If the worst case scenario of climate change happens and the sea levels rise, they will be facing the uh, inundation that you will. But the difference is they're close to the mainland of the United States and they'll be relatively easy, although expensive, uh, and it'll be a big dislocation for them and a financial loss for them, but they'll be able to move um, uh, inland. And I'm in Alaska, I assume you'll, you know, Shishmaref moving inland and the other uh, uh, Nutak moving inland, uh, you can find higher ground, whereas the Maldives you don't have higher ground to move to after a certain point. Uh, so the question is, uh, I guess, uh, what, uh, what mitigation are you looking at, uh, uh, starting uh, with Mr. Abdullah, in terms of, you know, is there a way to hold the sea back uh, from your nation should uh, the, the sea rise be uh, in the mid to higher level of what's pro projected? Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, um Yes, indeed. Um, there are clear ways that we can mitigate the, the greenhouse gas impact. As, as, a, as I might say, you know, the, the increase in sea surface temperature threatens the very existence of our country, both economically and, and physically. The two industries, namely the fisheries and the tourism, are going to be exhausted. And the, the natural defense, sea defense of the coral reefs it serves as, as a natural protection as well as, as the economic factor. I think losing this is, is, is going to be, uh, uh, as I said in, in my statement, is going to be a, a death of a nation. Um, in terms of, of uh, mitigation, as, as also um, uh, just want to tap in, in the, there are clear ways and means that we can, we can do something. For example, the Sweden, the Denmark, UK, uh, are reducing emissions while growing their economies. UK has reduced emissions while enjoying the healthy economic growth. And while mental technologies are among the biggest exports, export sectors in. I think there are some very good examples that the, the, some of the um, Annex I countries are, are taking lead on. I think uh, here the Congress can uh, sort of um, um, insist or, or uh, justify within these examples. And um, on adaptation, um, Maldives have been adapting to climate change ever since. And we have a very clear directions, very clear pro uh, proposals that we are implementing at the moment. And it is, it is high time that we start speedy implementation of this. Otherwise, we are seeing, witnessing every now and then the real impact of climate change and sea level rise. And as I said in, in my statements, we don't have anywhere to go. It's, it barely exceeds 1.5 meter above mean sea level. And if the projected sea level rise exceeds, and by the end of this century, we may submerge the internation. So. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. My, my time is the last, <laughs> but I might suggest that uh, we've had in the past a sister city program between cities in the United States and, and cities in other countries around the world, uh, and this might be an opportunity for us to have uh, to establish the same kind of relationship where a city or an island uh, or a community in the United States that's threatened by uh, increased sea level or, or other uh, climate change effects would partner with a country like yours and thereby share information and establish the identification needed to, to act, you know, to get us to act together. And uh, with that, I yield back to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from, um, from uh, 
New York. And uh, the chair will now recognize himself for uh, a series of questions. Um, you mentioned, Mr. King, um, your support for a, passing a bold energy program. What aspects of the proposed energy bill do you feel most directly strengthen the lives of the most vulnerable? Mr. Chairman, could you, I, I'm sorry, I'm which, just. Which part of the energy bill that we're now considering do you believe affects most significantly the lives of the most vulnerable? Which things in there do you believe are going to be most helpful in shifting our, our policy in a way that helps those who are vulnerable here and around the world? Well, I, I, think, I think looking at it from a, a comprehensive standpoint, uh, and I, I, I probably would like to say I need to get back to you on that. Just well, what, because what, I don't, role, I don't, what role will the Green College Jobs part of the bill play in a minority community? The bill that, uh, the, the parts of the bill that uh, Congresswoman Solis is principally responsible for? Well, spe specifically, I think any time that you can uh, create, you know, options for, for poor people, um, when, when, when we're talking about the jobs part of it, uh, and also begin to, you know, re re reduce emissions, which um, is a huge, huge task, but something that I guess we, we not guess, we, we've got to do. We've got to find a way to, to address. Um, I, I guess, um, and I, I want to be direct, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I have all the information today. I can certainly, I can certainly get something back to you, though. Okay, please. I would very much appreciate okay. it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gauna, um, in your written testimony, you mentioned the success that some communities have had in Brownfields development. Can we expand on what helped create those successes? What does the Congress need to do? to help ensure that we can learn from these successes as we build a green energy future? Thank you, Representative Markey. There, there was actually a study, I believe, performed by the Environmental Protection Agency or the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, I'm not sure what, that looked at five areas that were high impact communities where there were brownfield development and, and kind of looked at those to see what happened. and. Interesting enough, I know it, it, it sounds rather common, but th the earlier you get that community in, uh, give them independent technical review of the proposals, they were able to suggest, you know, very interesting options to deal with some of the higher impacts. The, the problem that we see from my end of it is that permitting officials are very hesitant to use legal authority to, to address environmental justice issues. So just having the legal authority there, having a, a signal, a strong signal from Congress to promote early participation, to give resources, to, to require heavy, heavy public participation uh, requirements in siting and permitting is is going to create the synergies that are needed to help resolve the, so the problems on a site-specific level. These problems differ with the nature of the enterprise, so so I apologize. I can't be any more specific than that because... Okay, because no, I what, appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay. Let me, let me ask you, Mr. Williams, um, and, and you, Mr. Abdullah, uh, what are the financial costs that we're talking about? Uh, what is the scale of financial resources that is going to be necessary, for example, to relocate the tribes up in Alaska. You know, I've seen estimates of 100 million to 400 million per community in order to relocate, relocate them inland. Can you give us some scale of what the totality of this financial cost to our country will be in order to protect well, I would uh, agree to uh, some of the projections, uh, at least $100 million per community. And when you talk about 150 communities that are going to be uh, oh my uh, passed down the road in the next 50 to 100 years, uh, it's going to have uh, extra wow. insurmountable cost uh, uh, to our government, which has a trust responsibility to the tribes to uh, deliver that. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, deal with those communities and, um, and you know, uh, Senator Stevens just uh, had uh, 
a hearing on um, erosion problems and uh, and it just uh, is going to have um, huge costs to the federal government if we don't begin to start addressing this issue right now and that's why I uh, enthusiastically came here to testify to make sure that um, uh, this is a top priority. So it's fair to say then, Mr. Williams, that it will cost the federal government billions of dollars to relocate the tribes in Alaska unless we put in place the policies that don't necessitate having to relocate yes. the tribes. Billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Yes. Um, so when people minimum. say that we can't afford to put in place these measures, the truth is we can't afford not to. The costs are going to become staggering for our country. Yes. Now, Mr. Abdullah, can you talk about the Maldives briefly in terms of the financial costs uh, to your country? Um, thank you, Representative um, Chair. Um, yes, um, the cost of uh, relocation and the cost of uh, cost of protection. Um, if we are to look at the cost of uh, relocating a family of average of six people, we're talking about 500 to 800,000 US dollars per family. And, and the cost of uh, coastal protection works is, is four to 500,000 500, US dollars per linear meter. Per? Per linear meter. Linear meter. Per, in other words, in order to build protection around an island. Yes. It costs and for example, 500, if, I, if I may say, the cost, the cost of uh, coastal protection of the capital island, Mali, which is about, um, I guess it's about nine to 10 kilometers, it cost the, the, end, the, the, the total cost of the project was about 130 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. That's only cost of one island. And if we are to save about 50 islands, we're talking about Two billion U.S. dollars. Wow! And you, that, do, does the Maldives have the two billion dollars? No, unfortunately. So it would be don't. the inter, it would be the international community that was asked to come in to help. That's true. That's why that's why I have highlighted that the importance of speedy implementation of our national adaptation pr plan of action is highly important, and we are doing at most that we can do. We have incorporated that into our national development plans. And we are spending from our national budgets annually. And the speed of it is, is, is that we can't wait until the waves are hit by the communities. And we are seeing every, every monsoon that enormous amount of devastation to these communities. And it is daily. And I'm, I'm one of them who witness daily. And, and I visit these communities. And they are really, really. In, in, in deep trouble. If we are not, not to save them, I don't know. I mean, they're going to be. I th thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you for coming here. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Insight. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Um, I want to ask Mr. Williams, uh, as far as short-term relief, I've, I've seen that the Folks in Shishmarif have voted to move to Tin Creek, as I understand it, and they have millions of dollars of relocation costs. What in the short term is the most feasible way to actually help the federal government help that relocation effort? Is it, is it a specific bill? Is it a grant? Is it an earmark? What, what's the best thing for us to consider? <clears throat> Well, um, I think uh, the best thing uh, for you to consider right now is to uh, make sure that um, your, the uh, policy in greenhouse gas emissions is reduced immediately. You know, I think the human beings can uh, uh, do uh, some action right now to prevent uh, further erosion. And if we don't take any action right now as human beings that are causing uh, this uh, problem, I think uh, we can save many millions of dollars down the road, but it has to be, action has to be now, but in terms of short-term um, uh, uh, solutions, I think uh, 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 both uh, the federal government uh, uh, need to uh, hold uh, extensive hearings uh, on each community. Each community has uh, different um, issues to deal with. and. Uh, 
and those 150 to 180 communities in Alaska, I think, uh, has uh, uh, different solutions to each uh, issue. So I think uh, uh, it would be a, a short-term uh, um, solution to uh, travel up there and to meet with each community on how are they going to deal with the, uh, the issue of uh, uh, short-term uh, solutions. Has there been given any thought of uh, establishing a fund? And I'm just sitting here thinking stream of consciousness. If we're really going to start having to relocate communities, should we give some thought to a, you know, a specific fund for that purpose for multiple communities? Yes, uh, I think it um, is urgent and um, and we're just, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, existing there. And, uh, and you know, I, I think uh, the federal government, I realize, it has a trust responsibility to uh, the tribes of this nation. And, uh, and I think uh, some sort of fund uh, would uh, be of great help to, uh, um, to help down the road. And uh, it's going to be... Uh, affecting us uh, in a long term and uh, moving schools and moving homes and health facilities is going to be enormous roads etc uh, but uh, but uh, the uh, uh, threat is real and it's right in our uh, face right now and uh, and we need to uh, have uh, action plans right now so we can avoid more costs down the road by the way, by asking these questions, I don't mean to infer that we don't need to s stop this from happening and taking proactive measures. I've been working with the chair and folks on this committee to do that, and I believe we can do that. I just uh, There's a book called Apollo's Fire out there that talks about what we can do to stop this from happening. I know because I helped co-author it. So I know that we can do this, but the problem is that there's so much of this locked into the system already even if we stop today CO2 pollution, we're going to have a lot of damage that we have to deal with. And so I'm interested in any further thoughts you had at any time about how to move forward on a fund like this. I would like to hear them. I'm sure there are others as well. And I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Great. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. Here's what I'm going to ask each of you to do. Give us the one minute, the one minute you want, to, you want us to remember. Um, as we're going forward through the end of this year on the energy bill and then into the, uh, the uh, cap and auction and trade bill that we'll be uh, considering next year. We'll begin with you, Mr. Abdullah. What do you want us to remember? Thank you, uh, Representative. Um, I want you to remember that please don't let the voice of the most vulnerable countries on the face of the planet to go unheard that we remain as a sovereign state and none of the Maldives will want to be our environmental refugees unless or otherwise we are forced to. Bear in mind that please help us to be as a sovereign state not to be a victim from the global warming and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Mr. Williams. I would like to, uh, for you to uh, remember is, uh, is uh, alternative energy uh, is the way to go. I think we've seen enough of, uh, of um, producing um, uh, in vulnerable areas uh, of the world in energy production. I think there needs to be, we need to capture the wind, the solar, the uh, biomass, the other alternative energies, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, power companies, et cetera. So I think there are other ways of uh, addressing this issue, and I want you to remember clearly that uh, more uh, development in vulnerable areas that are very important to our environment and to our existence is very important to me. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Professor Ghana. Uh, I would like to leave you with the thought is that as we build our new cleaner energy infrastructure, which we must, 
uh, that a simple requirement that impacts to vulnerable communities should be avoided, minimized, or mitigated to the extent feasible, together with requirements for alternative site uh, analyses can go a long way to inject common sense and protectiveness into a permitting process, and this is going to avoid a lot of problems down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Mr. King. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to uh, add a caveat, I guess, to what Mr. Williams stated, and that is that uh, clearly today most consumers do not have a choice as it relates to whether it's uh, fuel for your automobile or whether it's uh, heating oil for your home, we, we need more choices. And uh, the new sources of energy that can be produced um, will create jobs and opportunities for people uh, in our nation and perhaps an entire new economy that, uh, a clean economy. Uh, so I, 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 I just want to add my voice to, to the voice of, of all those who believe consumers need choices, clean choices, better choices. Thank you. Um, well, we, we thank you, Mr. King. We thank all of the panelists. Uh, many of you have uh, come a long, long way to be testifying here with us today. Uh, the Select Committee very much appreciates uh, the effort that you have made. And we want you to know that this testimony today uh, is going to play a big role in the way in which our committee uh, views this bill that is now pending in the next six to eight weeks before the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, it's, a po it's a powerful, powerful um, thing to hear the kind of testimony that you delivered today, and it's going to make a big difference uh, before the end of this year. Uh, we thank you, uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>